All right. So, uh, path starts and possibility. So, let me start with the thing that whoever has attended Unkita's defense talk, that was a kind of technical talk on this topic. And now the similar thing I am going to say as a sort of colloquium, which is almost like non-technical. You will find only one or two equations here. And rest of the things I will try to explain. I will try to give you an overview of what's known, what we are trying to do, things like that. So as I outline, I say that I will first talk about first stars. First means really the first stars which were appeared in the universe. I will talk about that and their property, what we know about them, what we don't know about them, things like that. Then I will talk about what first stars did to our universe. What their effects to the evolution of our universe. Next thing I'll talk about something known as 21 centimeter signal. I'm not going to talk much detail about it because of two reasons. Thing the first one is it will be very much technical. And next thing is that you will you are going to have a complete colloquium on the 21 centimeter signal next uh, next in yeah. two weeks from now by uh, Professor Pugna Dharadhar from IID Paro. So that's why I'm not going to touch that. Only few things which I need for describing my talk, I will just touch upon them. Then I'll talk about what are the cosmic rays, what, are, what do we know about them, what is their role in the evolution of our universe, how do they affect Shaping the uh, initial initial thermal history of the universe, and then I will for the uh, last five or ten minutes I will talk about how this this far star and cosmic ray and this twenty one centimeter signal they come all together to know about our history of the universe. This is roughly the outline of my talk. So let's start with, well, it's a cosmology kind of talk. So I'll start with something Big Bang Theory. This cartoon or picture all you have seen, most of you have seen, that it started with the Big Bang. And initially, the things were completely homogeneous. Whatever matter, whatever you see, it was almost a homogeneous thing. Everywhere, everything was similar, whether density, whether energy, whatever temperature, everything was the same at the beginning of the universe. And the uh, observational evidence for that is nothing other than the cosmic microwave background radiation. But today, we see in the universe, which is technically known as structures. Structures mean nothing but stars, galaxies, or even uh, planets. So we, what do you mean by planet stars? Their density is pretty high, whereas in between interplanetary, uh, in between two planets, there is nothing. So it means it's not at all homogeneous or isotropy. If I look in this direction, I will hit one star. I will not hit another star after a long, long time. So today, whatever you see is not at all a homogeneous thing. How the universe which started from a complete, almost like a homogeneous thing to uh, to today's universe, that's generally described, which is known as the Big Bang cosmology. And in this, according to Big Bang cosmologies, the thing 
like dark galaxy etc are formed in a hierarchical manner what do you mean by hierarchical manner is that the small things which are in the smallest scale the smallest galaxies let's say are formed fast from there the bigger and bigger galaxies are formed later and later so if i look back in time i can only see very small galaxies at the past where if i look at my nearby universe which is the recent universe i can see big galaxies or even a cluster of galaxies which are come together and make a single unit a cluster of galaxies so this is the hierarchical structure formation structure means like galaxy galaxy cluster stars whatever you know and today and according to this big bang theory the far stars are likely to form around redshift of 30 to 20 between somewhere like 30 to 20 redshift is nothing but a indicator of time so when the universe started we say it's the infinite redshift today is the zero redshift and in between some intermediate time we we'll say in terms of redshift so if you think about in terms of time so redshift 30 or will be just 1 billion years after the formation of the universe as you know that uh, the universe is like 14 billion year old so roughly around somewhere around 1 billion year after the for, uh, after the big bang the first stars were appeared in the universe now if you look at here i put a first stars less galaxies and uh, i have also put a question here the reason i have done this is that what do you mean by a galaxy when is a galaxy what is a galaxy typically you talk about when you talk about a galaxy it's nothing but a uh, uh, it's kind of few millions or billions of stars are forming together in a single very close region of space that's what we call a galaxy Like for our Milky Way galaxy consists of uh, a billion, ten billion stars. That's what we call galaxy. But when the first star or first galaxies are formed, like uh, one billion years after the Big Bang, in a galaxy, so-called galaxy, there could have been only one star. So when the first stars appear, you will say that well. it is the first star of that galaxy so the star itself is composed of a single galaxy could be composed of a single star okay. that's why i have put it like a, it's you can say it's first star or first galaxy so i'm not going to distinguish between a first star or galaxy as such with keeping in mind that whichever is forming the stars itself because stars are forming inside galaxy kind of well let me go little bit further let's say what do you know is that from the big bang cosmological model that we know there is something called dark matter which you don't see at all but we feel its effect and this dark matter they come together collapsed and form a something called dark matter halo inside which the stars are formed the stars are formed from the gas gas like hydrogen and helium that we can see but this dark matter or the dark matter halo we cannot see directly but we can feel their effect so inside a dark matter halo the gas will form stars then the initial stars the first stars are likely to form as you already mentioned around redshift 30 to 20 whatever i am talking about the first star first galaxy we have not seen yet any one of them 
because they're far, far away from me. And you can imagine, I can only see to my naked eye the stars of our own galaxy, nothing else. Even with powerful telescopes like uh, Hubble telescope, we can go up to say redshift of 10 or so, as beyond as redshift 10, that much we can observe. And we're talking about stars which are formed at even early in time, which is redshift of 30 or 20. There is no direct evidence of this far stars of our galaxy. But I talked about HST. One of the goal of the GWST is recently for uh, James Webb Telescope. One of the goal is to detect this fast star, observe this fast star with a special kind of gravitational lensing. Some of you have already heard talk on gravitational lensing. A uh, few weeks back, even just uh, before closing the uh, uh, puja vacation, so it's the same. So what does it do? It just magnifies. It's a lens, gravitational lens, so it magnifies things. So if something magnifies, so I see it is brighter. So you can. And if you remember, they are talking about the magnification of roughly few tens or maximum hundred. So brightness will be boosted by hundred times maximum, whatever you have heard. But this one is another kind of special gravitational lensing, which is known as something called caustic transit, which magnifies any object like 1000 to 10,000 times. So if such thing happens, then only I will be able to detect these fast stars with the help of JWT. Consider magnification is 10 to the 3 or 10 to the 5 orders then only you will be able to detect a single star, which was a fast star. And this is one of the goal of this recently toned JWS. All right. So we don't know yet. We have not seen it. But what we know about the fast star? What we definitely know about fast stars is that they are forming fast. So they are forming from the gas that were produced at the time of Big Bang. And we know that at the time of Big Bang, only hydrogen and helium was there. And no other, a little amount of lithium and helium was there, but no other heavy element was present at that time. So they must be made of only this hydrogen and helium and no other heavy element which is which we fondly call as the metal free. Don't have anything higher than helium. This one and these stars are generally called as population three stars or pop three stars. This is the only thing we know about the first ones, definitely. We don't know anything about it. Anything else is conclusively known to us. What do you mean by conclusively known to us? We, whoever has done the, the basic course in astronomy, they know that we can solve the stellar structure. Things like that, given the mass, Given their composition, I know how they are going to evolve, each and every star. But what is not known at all about the first stars is how big they were. Why we don't know them? The reason is that well, when, it, uh, when you are forming a dark matter halo, when you are forming it, 
the gas is gas within this dark matter halo gets heated up. Now, if you have to form stars, you have to cool the gas. Only cooling mechanism available in the primordial gas is through hydrogen line cooling. What do you mean by hydrogen line cooling? It's like two hydrogen atoms, let's say it's going to collide with each other, excite the electron to some a higher excited state. This electron will jump down, produce a photon. This photon is going to leak from the system, and that's how it can radiate energy from the system and it can cool. If you have only hydrogen atom, then you can cool gas if it is beyond 10 to the power 4 Kelvin. If the gas is over 10 to the power 4 Kelvin, then only you will be able to cool with the help of this hydrogen line cool. But most of the galaxies or the dark matter halos, whichever they are formed, when they collapsed initially, so called the small halos, their temperature were less than 10 to 5 So, it's a yes. I think maybe the reason that you can't cool, I mean, by line cooling, if hydrogen line cooling uh, can't cool gas below 10 to 5 4 Kelvin. Yes. The physical reason for that? Physical reason is that so you are collision, it's collision. Which is making you probably in the transition from lower to higher. And the, so it, it has a minimum threshold energy. And your Maxwellian curve, if it is not beyond the number 4 Kelvin, will not have sufficient barrier to stop the energy. That That's why you cannot. Okay. Then how do you pull it? People think it's not well established. People think that when it is for only hydrogen atom, but you can form hydrogen molecule at that place. If you can form hydrogen molecule, then the molecular vibration level there they don't need that much higher energy. So if you can form molecular hydrogen, then you can cool in those mini galaxies. The gas can be cooled in those mini galaxies and then you can form star. Okay. Now thing is we don't know exactly how much how much hydrogen molecule you can form. It's not very well known given the density and other things. Also, it's not very, uh, the, these hydrogen molecules can be easily dissociated by any energy you have outside. So, let's say you form a first star with the help of hydrogen molecule and cooling, and the radiation from this first star will dissociate hydrogen molecule nearby it. And it's going to completely prevent further star formation. This is the reason we don't know how many actually you can form this first. How many first? That really depends on how efficient the how cooling is. How efficient cooling is, what is the density and a lot of other things. This is the first problem. Second problem is that not only cooling, we don't know, we don't understand the cooling very easily, we don't understand the gravitational instabilities that were uh, that required to when the gas is collapsing, you need to fragment. Fragment due to gravitational instabilities that will set up <coughs> this accretion process. And due to these gravitational instabilities, you will produce fragments. 
in this primordial environment how the fragments will be and that's uh, that is not known to us known to us means that it's a big system you have to simulate and see in actual numerical simulation how fragments are building up for example in our galaxy if you look at our nearby galaxy the star mass distribution is like you have very much high number of low mass stars and very small number of high mass stars massive stars are very rare or less but in case of this primordial in the primordial gas condition where cooling is through only hydrogen cooling numerical simulations whatever is done till now that's not complete first of all let me tell you they are not at all complete because uh, they have different shortcomings like you don't have sufficiently high resolution to your forward you are solving a galaxy size things which is let's say 10 to the power uh, even uh, 5 or 10 to the power 6 solar mass object the gas mass and here you are talking about really molecular level transition i have to kind of uh, track each and molecule each and every molecule that's not true. yes that's good. very nice Initially, it's like the first part of the one compared to the ship. How do you know? Oh, it's like anything about it. No. So, what you know, what you know that initially, what was the fluctuation, the density fluctuation in the matter content? So, that's from CMB. That's from the CMB or whatever. That's from the CMB. Now, just given that you evolve in time with only help of time. And it's a statistical process. And statistically, you know when, let's say, 10 to the power 5 solar mass object is like to realize. Fully. And that's how you tell that uh, this is roughly the time where you expect to produce the fast um, gravitationally bound object inside which you will form, likely form. So that's why there is a big window. You don't we just say that this is possible. Right? Huh. Coming back to the numerical simulation, so they don't have enough uh, resolution to uh, tackle this problem. They don't have enough time. So you have also time to cover it. If you increase the resolution, which means you have to run for an infinite time. You don't have time. And also, you don't know all the physics if you put in inside. A single simulation you can attack. So due to this, all these limitations, there is no consensus about numerical simulations yet about the formation of the first stars. But people have think one thing is that in those primordial kind of conditions, high mass stars are formed roughly the roughly same in number compared to the lone star so one reason if you just think about it it comes in terms of genes mass since the cooling is rare there so there the genes mass of a gas is higher so if, if genes mass is higher, anything you have to collapse, if you want to collapse to a point, it has to be higher than the genes mass. Otherwise, you cannot collapse. The thermal uh, pressure will prevent it to uh, collapse. And since genes mass is higher, so roughly you can think that, okay, that is one thing which is making the first stars to be bigger. More so, so, uh, as you said that the situation we are in the star scenario is different compared to what we understand star formation in the late universe. Right. It's because, first of all, the gas is completely crystal, 
But with more than that, I think mean, that the reason that the cycling is because of the unknown, it's not efficient. Means. Not efficient. Yeah. This main reasons for which the process of star formation cannot be just directly extrapolated from how we do the genes instability and the low resting universe. Yeah. Again, genes must be always kind of yeah. Genes must be genes must. Uh, if you cannot say that there are critical mass of time, there are some things that can change. change the way. It's not a hard part, uh, like what people call as the kind of thing. And definitely, the presence of metal take part in this, this kind of process. Yeah. Because metal is uh, any other, uh, other than hydrogen and helium, if you have any other elements. There, the line is efficient at low temperature because for hydrogen, you require at least lime and alpha photon energy, whereas in case of metals, that transition is very small, then lower energy. I first thought to do the, the pushing that cooling curve, but I didn't uh, put it here. So, you can see that if you have only hydrogen and helium present, then the cooling is in completely inefficient beyond, uh, below 10 to the power 4 kilo. Whereas if you have very small amount of even small amount of metal, this uh, cooling is get enhanced at this low low energy. Low energy. Okay. So this is what I have seen shown here that simulation if you see that all mass this is 10 to the power 1 which is 10 this is 100 and this is 1000. So even 1000 solar mass, a single star of 1000 solar mass can fall in those primordial, uh, <laughs> primordial gas. Whereas in our case, in the, our metal thing is that maximum whatever we have seen is maybe 40, 80, something like that. Not more, definitely not more than 100. Not more than 100 solar mass will a single star which is 100 times the uh, mass of the sun, you have not seen. But in primordial condition, you can really form such high mass star. Yeah. Yes. So the point Rafi was showing, it yeah. was that the number of different mass stars are roughly equal. Yeah. But uh, how this can be? Because if we are saying that we need the genes instability, conditions to form the stars, then the stars which are bigger, yes. means uh, if the gas cloud is of heavy mass, it is more probable to form a star rather than the gas cloud having smaller mass. Then how is this possible that uh, if a gas cloud is bigger, yes. the probability of it to form a star is always higher if the gas, rather than the gas cloud having a smaller mass. That's true. But then how can this it's, be? it's what you are looking at how smaller planet it can form from a bigger planet. Okay? And generally it is said that you will form if it is fragmenting, you will form more smaller fragment compared to bigger fragment. So, so the number of smaller fragments is high. So even if the probability is low, the number number, but the genes criteria is making that I am not able to form stars from lower plum, whereas I can form stars from higher uh, fragment. So finally, when you are actually forming star, they are making it obvious. This is roughly the scenario. But you will see that there are different kind of scenarios that we plotted. And they completely, they don't match with each other. There is no real consensus about it. But this definitely not something like something. Yes, definitely not like something like this. So, in the first upper plot, so what I see is that there are two kind of situations are con considered. So, one is that without, don't consider it. I can see that in the high mass range, and the the histograms that mostly contribute are those that consider radiative feedback, while those that don't, they actually don't reach. So, why is that? that Again, radiative feedback will enhance the temperature for the smaller objects, and that will prevent it from the stars. 
Okay. Yeah. All right. Then what will you do if we don't know anything and we are yet to observe the first star? Then how will you proceed? How will you proceed is some indirect observation. What do you mean by indirect observation? I am not going to see the star itself. I am trying to see its effect on the surrounding medium. Like what you do for black hole. Black hole you don't see. What we see is its effect surrounding. The very similar way, what is the effect of this first star that we are going to see surrounding the universe? Things we are talking about uh, very early in time, there we had only neutral hydrogen, and from there we can have only one signal except for gravitational wave is the 21 centimeter signal. That is the most prominent signal that we can have during this so called cosmic dawn because dawn we are saying because that is the time when the first light of the universe we see, first stars are. What is, uh, so what is 21 centimeter signal? As I said, I am not going to say much detail about it. It's it's a transition which is seen only in neutral hydrogen. It's a hyperfleeting transition of wavelength 21 centimeter, which is the in the radio wavelength. And in the uh, so in the intergalactic medium, the intergalactic medium means medium between two galaxies, it is neutral hydrogen present. From there, you can either see this 21 centimeter signal either as an emission, emission or as an absorption, depending on the condition of the intergalactic medium. Either you can see it as an emission or emission coming 21 centimeter signal, emission coming from it, or from the CMB, it is absorbing at the 21 centimeter. So that's the other radiation. That's the other radiation you have in the universe. Okay. So you said lights earlier. This is the, the first light. These are first visible. First, first visible. Or first electromagnetic radiation other than CMB. CMB. All right. And how much radiation or absorption you are going to see? It depends on the temperature of the neutral gas. Two things it depends. First one is that amount of neutral hydrogen is as present because that is what it is either absorbing or emitting. If it is not neutral hydrogen, if it is ionized hydrogen, then it's not doing anything. It's a transition of purely neutral hydrogen. Okay. So it depends on this is the rho H1, which is the neutral hydrogen. And another thing it depends on the in temperature of the neutral hydrogen or the intergalactic medium. If you look at this term, it says that 1 minus T gamma by T s, where T gamma is the background radiation, which is the temperature of the CMB radiation. And T s is known as something known as spin temperature which governs the relative population between these two transition layers. And that depends on the T gamma, which is a Tg, which is the gas temperature. So, yes. What was the wavelength of the plane? You just multiply by one plus. So, that time, then the first term and pop. CMB is black body, but you are talking about the peak wave. Peak wave. CMB is actually 1000 like what? No, 60 Kelvin. Not 1000, let's say 10, 10, 10, 20. 20. So, um, 60 Kelvin. 60 Kelvin. Roughly 60 Kelvin black. So, I'm not going to say details about all these things. Only depends on the amount of neutral hydrogen and mostly depends on the temperature of the gas. Now, if this T is 
is lower than t gamma, then this is greater than 1. So this is negative. So you see absorption. If Ts is higher than t gamma, then this is positive. So you see as an emission. That's what you have been seeing here. So depending on some condition, it's some kind of uh, condition it has been taken, showing that that from starting from uh, uh, yes here. Yeah. So initially you will see it in emission, then it will become absorption, and then again maybe emission or absorption, depending on some model parameter, what is the typical condition. Then again, you are going to see a absorption and then finally zero. Zero because, uh, uh, as we know, maybe you may be knowing that around rate six, six or so, the entire intergalactic medium becomes completely ionized. So if you don't have any neutral hydrogen, you are not going to see any effect of it. That's why you see it complete zero. That's from observation, you surely know that has happened by red Okay. So the universe got again ionized. Uh, again got ionized. No more neutral ionized. No more neutral ionized. Any of this. Any of this. Oh, yeah. uh, there are some coupling constant. It's a Lyon alpha coupling constant, and X is a collisional coupling constant. So all this makes your population between two levels. How much is the related population between two levels? This can be positive and negative. No. So positive. 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 Coupling is always positive. But their values could be pretty small depending on the density and other things. So it's cross-section. Correct. 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 So, as I, I said, I'm not going to go into the technical detail of this equation. Yes. Yeah. 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 In the galactic medium, there is neutral hydrogen. We are saying that the most prominent signal is the 21 centimeters. Yes. Yeah. But if it is neutral hydrogen, yeah. can we see the laminar physics? Laminar yeah. physics? It is not going to be any. How is it going to be any? Why is the absorption? Because something has to be at that energy level. You have to have that much of energy coming from background to absorb it. You have only the you have only CMB which is 60 Kelvin. So that's the only thing it has. It is that's the only thing. Okay. And as we said that this emission or absorption, this depends on the amount of neutral hydrogen or the temperature. These things are going to get modified by the fire. So if we can observe very accurately this 21 centimeter signal. Then I can infer what was the properties of the first star at that time, how many were there, what was their type, things like that. We get indirect, even though we cannot see them directly. This is one of the ways to get information about the first star. Now I'm coming to my the other part of the talk, which is the cosmic rays. What are cosmic rays? Cosmic rays are nothing but high energy charged particle, very, very high energy charged particle, which has been originating in outside the earth from stars or whatever we don't know. It is coming to us from the cosmos. What do you mean by high energy? If you look at this plot, it's starting from GV to EV, and this is 10 to the power 21 electron volt. And this is experimentally detected cosmic rays. So you have charged particle having energy of 10 to the power 21 EV. 
if you compare with our best experimental setup, which is the SAR, it produces only PV electron, PV energy, which is 10 to the power 12. And we are, but our universe, they are accelerating up to 10 to the power 21, which is billion or <coughs> billion times higher than what we can produce at a rate. Okay. That is one interesting thing. So it composed of, if you look at here, that it's not only proton, it has electron, of course, and it also has higher element like uh, iron, silicon, magnesium, everything is present here. It mostly, of course, composed of proton, but you can detect higher element as well. If you look at the spectrum, it's almost a power. It's almost a power law of uh, two, uh, e to the power minus 2.7. This is the power law after you get. And you look at the order. It's starting from G V 10 to the power 9 to 10 to the power 21. You are going to get roughly the same power law there. There are some features, some people call it mini angle. There are some features like that. But overall, it's a power law. So these are the cosmic rays. Cosmic coming from outside and this is also a kind of energy spectrum. And if you look at the energy, is maximum around G. One thing to remember that even though you are getting a cosmic ray of ten to the twenty one EV. The number is higher in, uh, near the GeV, and most of the energy is carried by GeV protons. And if you see here, it is going to get down there. So basically, it actually gets down. Even, uh, their number is higher, but the energy is less. So it starts around. So energy is maximum carried by the GeV proton. And GeV is the red mass energy of the proton. So around that energy is the maximum energy carried by the uh, cosmic rays. Question is how they originate, where they originate. They mostly accelerated in shocks. What kind of shocks? Mostly we think there are the shocks created by the supernova explosion. That's the major place where you produce the cosmic rays. But again, uh, supernova is not enough to produce a 10 to the power 21 EV uh, cosmic ray. They are not enough. They don't have enough energy to accelerate there. Then we yet don't know actually where is, from where you can get such high energy cosmic rays. People think that maybe active galactic nuclei could be one possibility. Then another possibility is the structure formation shock. Structure formation shock means when you are forming galaxies or when you are forming cluster of galaxies, their gas also gets shocked. And those shocks there, you may, you may generate such kind of high energetic particle. And the, uh, how do you accelerate it? There is something called Fermi acceleration by which you can accelerate charged particle where you produce a shock. Okay. Now this, why suddenly we are thinking about cosmic rays? Why they are important? Why they are important? That's because if you, from the observation, from the observation, whatever we see as a cosmic ray, the total energy density of the cosmic ray is almost equal to the energy density in the thermal gas of the interstellar medium. And if you know, interestingly, it's so uh, thermal gas is at 10 to the power 4 Kelvin. That's the energy of uh, our interstellar medium gas. 
this energy density is almost equal to the energy density we have in the magnetic fields in our galaxy. Because you have uh, uh, micro Gauss amount of energy, uh, micro Gauss magnetic field. And if you do B square by 2 pi, you'll again get 1 EV per centimeter cube as the energy density, which is also interestingly is the energy density of CMB. So they're comparable. So if thermal gas is making impact on the star formation or whatever, then the cosmic ray is to be also doing something in this process. That's why you should always consider the cosmic ray component while actually you are doing any simulation of star formation or galaxy. Because the energy densities are really comparable to other component of the energy density of the universe. And if you look, if the simulation has shown that most, uh, we have seen that uh, galaxy has outflows. What do you mean by outflows? That it's throwing out material or throwing out gas from the galaxy, the galactic center, uh, near the center. And most of People earlier think that it is the supernova which produce this galactic outflows. But it has been shown that even these cosmic rays, they have enough power to actually drive this outflow. And they actually sometimes means, sometimes means in driving the outflow because thermal gas, they can radiatively cool. Whereas this high energy particle, the cosmic ray, mostly the cosmic ray protons, they are not going to cool radiating. And they have a lesser adiabatic index of gamma. So if they expand adiabatically, their gamma is less steeper so compared to the thermal gas. So at the outside of the galaxy, their energy density will be higher compared to the thermal gas and hence they will put more pressure to this outflowing material. So in this, these two cases, <clears throat> cosmic ray actually helps in driving the outflows from the galaxy. This is one thing. Another thing is that it can also change the thermal history of the intergalactic medium. How that I am going to say later. So if you look at this is, this is, this has been shown around redshift two to three that these are temperature or energy density of thermal gas. And these are some models of cosmic ray which is heating the intergalactic medium. Okay, around I should have mentioned. So when I'm talking about cosmic rays, it's everything. Okay. But cosmic rays are the only the proton component. They can get escaped from the galaxy potential because they are collisional cross-section is less. But electrons, they produce. They also produce in the shock, but since their momentum is less, so they get absorbed within the galaxy. Iron also is there. Higher cross-section is there. But the number-wise, iron and other things are pretty less. Electron. The kinetic energy of the photon must be higher than escapes the escapes potential. Potential. It is not only potential, it's uh, something called it's, it also direct because it is not the magnetic field basis. So it's direct along the magnetic field and it slowly diffuses out from the uh, galactic disk or galactic. It, it moves out. Okay. 
observationary it has been proven or shown that a cosmic ray stays in our galaxy around 10 to the power 7 years. How? How? It's a very simple way. You just take that how many supernovas have been forming and what should be the amount of cosmic ray it has in total accumulated. And I know the energy to a budget of observed, uh, observed uh, cosmic ray energy density. So we, from there, we can find out what is the uh, escape time you require to match this energy budget. From there, you see that this, and remember, we have the energies, energy, most of the energy is around DV. Low energy, low energy like can be, uh, any of the energy proton, they get absorbed within our galaxy. They get absorbed. Only the high energy protons, they get uh, escape from the galactic potential and they can cause this uh, temperature change in the intergalactic region. That's what I will get through here. Okay? So, yeah. Again, naive question. Yeah. Why are you thinking only of redshift 10? Oh, this is something you had considered there. I am going to consider oh, the, 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 there. This is some connection. Yes, 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 of course. It's just showing that this was done early. So, because this is another interesting uh, region where actually to measure the intergalactic medium temperature increases. It's there is a you see a rise in the temperature of the intergalactic medium around redshift two to three, and people attribute mostly to something called helium reionization rules. But he showed that even cosmic ray can, can, can explain that. In That's what was the word. All right. Now, how does the cosmic rays and fast earth they do? So again, the fast earth, as I mentioned, they are mostly big stars. So they ended up their life as supernova. And if you have a supernova, you will form a shock, and there you are going to definitely accelerate cosmic ray more than here, whatever we are accelerating here, locally. Okay. Now, a fraction of total supernova energy is going to get into the accelerating the cosmic ray particle. All right. Now, if what I have talked to you that in case of our galaxy, low energy cosmic ray or the cosmic ray protons, they don't get outside of the galaxy. But remember, in case of first stars, they are needed. They can escape. They are even low energy cosmic ray can escape the halo along with the high energy part. And this low energy cosmic ray, they can collisionally excite the collisionally interact or ionize the uh, intergalactic medium and transfer energy to the intergalactic medium, which in turn is going to heat the intergalactic medium. This is the low energy cosmic. What about high energy cosmic rays? High energy cosmic rays in presence of magnetic field. If you have magnetic field, then it can generate something called magnetosonic alpha wave through which it can transfer energy from cosmic ray component to the thermal component. So there is a mechanism that high energy cosmic rays can transfer energy from cosmic ray component to the thermal but component. That, that would depend on also the physical conditions. Yes, definitely. You required a magnetic field first of all. Without magnetic field, you can no, you didn't know. Even earlier, you didn't know whether there was magnetic field or not. 
Result of it. Well, before the result, I saw I must have some observation of the twenty-one centimeter signal with which I can compare. Okay, So uh, this is the observed twenty-one centimeter signal. Around, if you look at this, is a, so absorption has been seen around redshift of. 18 or 17. This is a controversial uh, result. People have not confirmed yet that this is really happening. But this is the only thing we have right now. Okay, this is the only one observational uh, observation of 21 centimeter signal at that high energy. That's what we do. Now let's see what we do. So if you have taken into account of the cosmic the heating. Heating part is basically for absorption. Remember, I have to lower the temperature of the intergalactic medium. Yes. So that lower part is done by absorption, is done by uh, uh, taking into account of uh, a dark matter or baryonic interaction, by which we can achieve this cooling part. Then you require the heating. Heating part is due to the cosmic ray heat. And you can really explain with, definitely you have lots of three parameter model and you can do it there and whatever. So with some reasonable parameter, you can explain the heating part of this signal with this cosmic ray. Well, as I said that uh, it's a tentative detection. So basically you can, there are some effect of different model parameters of the cosmic ray, which you can see the emission, absorption, everything you can achieve with that, depending on the model parameter. So the basic thing is that you must consider the cosmic ray to model the 21 centimeter signal during this uh, cosmic dot. Otherwise, it will not be a complete model of your 21 centimeter signal. Okay. So just let me finish. So we don't have a, a direct detection of the first stars yet. So we have to, and also the numerical simulations are not yet any conclusive result that we are getting. Hence, to prove the physical nature of the first star, we have to probe indirect observations such as a 21 centimeter signal. And the cosmic ray which produced by those first star, they are going to alter the thermal history of the intergalactic medium. And so the age signal, whatever is the detection or detection, that can be explained with the help of the cosmic ray heating. Thanks. The time for questions. Yes, Moitro. Okay, so I have, I have one question regarding the ages observation, the power monitor observation. So yeah. uh, basically, you had you explained the cooling part and the heating part. Yes. And but the in the observation, there is also a lot of width in the. Yes. Yeah. How do you explain that? Well, in a smooth kind of thing, you will never be able to do. So, so you can change the fine tune there parameter. 